That's all. Um, it's been a great day so far, and I am pleased that, to be among all of us. My name is Jim Anderson. I am the president of Peace Action, of New York State Peace Action, and I am the national vice president of Peace Action, as well as serve on the board of the Campaign for Peace, Disarmament, and Common Security, a member of Abolition 2000, and much, much more. I am, like you, a concerned citizen. I want to say that truly in all that we heard and in a couple of the words that the Senator mentioned, I'll use a buzzword, he said decades. And when he talked about decades, he talked about decades of dealing with these issues that we're confronting today and particularly as we gather here. And as I thought about that, it resonated with me what Amanda Gorman said. And I thought, here we are. We are those who have stepped into a path. And since we stepped into this path, we are the ones who have the task on how we will repair it. With that said, I want to welcome you to this session. This session is Paths Forward. We talk a lot about these things, how terrible, we talk about what needs to be done, and we look around, we see some action, but not enough action. We see some of the ways in which we did engage, um, move some things in favor of humanity and peace, and yet there's much more that needs to be done. We've also discovered that many more are needed. When I say many more, many more people. People worldwide in communities like ours are pushing back on wayward governments who are putting so much money and so much effort in building and, and amassing weapons of war. People all over the world are trying to do everything that they can to get the dollars needed to, that will take care of housing, health care, education, all things needed, infrastructures of their cities and their nations and people all over the world like us are having this moment trying to find a way forward. With that said, I want to introduce my guests and the order I introduce them in is the order that they will come to us in. And at the end of all the presentations, we will have Q&A and uh, I'm looking for us to really get into this. I'm looking for us to see the light and to be the light in this session. And with that, I greet you again. And let me just say, the first one up will be Medea Benjamin of Cold Pink. And she'll be speaking to us on peacefully engaging Iran. After her will be Den Denise Duffield who is from Back From The Brink campaign. She is with, she'll be speaking on the Back From The Brink campaign. She is with the Physicians for Social Responsibilities, Los Angeles. And Lindsay Koshgarian, who is with the Institute for Policy Studies and who will talk to us on a moral budget for America. And finally, after that will be Senator Jamie Elridge, who is a state who will be speaking to us on state legislative issues. And with that said, I yield the floor to Medea. Hi, Medea, welcome you. It's always hey, good to see you. Jim, great to be on with you. And uh, thank you to the organizers for this incredible day of just extraordinary presentations and your organization is so impressive. So thank you for allowing me to be part of this. Um, I'm going to speak about Iran because it's such a critical issue from both the nuclear perspective, but just a, a horrific example of how the US can screw with a country for so many decades and create so many needless problems for the people who live there. And so just to frame this, uh, to keep in mind the U.S. overthrow of the democratically elected government of Iran in 1953, uh, the support for the repressive regime of the Shah that led to the 1979 revolution that was understandably anti-American, 
and uh, the U.S. has imposed some form of sanction on Iran ever since then. Let's also frame it uh, the way Iranians see why this focus on Iran uh, as uh, in terms of nuclear weapons. Uh, first of all, many Iranians say they're not even trying to get nuclear weapons, uh, but then they point to the United States as the largest uh, um, a country of, uh, that has thousands of nuclear weapons. And then they also point to Israel and say, why doesn't anybody call Israel out on its nuclear weapons, force it to join uh, the non-proliferation treaty, force it to have inspectors, et cetera. Um, and then the other is um, to recognize that the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal that was finally negotiated under Obama's um, term was not just a negotiation between the US and Iran, but it was also one between England, France, Germany, uh, the European Union as a whole, Russia, China. Uh, it was the world community and, and, and ratified, uh, supported by the Security Council of the United Nations. Um, those that uh, in the United States, uh, it was a tremendous feat for the Obama administration to move forward on that because there was so much opposition from US allies like Israel and Saudi Arabia, uh, but also so much internal opposition from lobby groups, from hawkish Congress people who said it wasn't strong enough, it didn't include ballistic missiles, it didn't deal with Iran's maligned activities in the region, and yet from the uh, John Kerry Obama point of view, uh, this was a significant breakthrough that would lead to discussions with Iran on many other issues. And I have traveled to Iran several times in our last visit there when we met with the foreign minister, Javad Zarif, uh, he said precisely that, that they said this was the beginning of talks with the US and other, uh, uh, and the Europeans uh, about all the conflicts in the region and how could they use this as establishing trust so that they could then deal uh, with so many of the other conflicts that need to be unraveled in the Middle East. In the meantime, we had Trump coming in and uh, withdrawing precipitously from this deal, imposing just horrific sanctions, uh, especially during a time of the pandemic. I remember being in Iran, walking through the marketplace when an elderly man came up and uh, knew that we were Americans because we had some signs on us and said, you know, why is your uh, country doing this to us, keeping uh, cancer medicine away from my wife who is dying? What did we do to you to deserve this? Um, so really uh, these um, cruel measures that hurt uh, 80 million people in Iran uh, and then almost bringing us to the brink of war January 2nd of last year with the assassination of General Soleimani. And I don't know about all of you, but I really felt that this was the beginning of uh, an all out war with Iran. Uh, and um, the uh, uh, results of Trump doing this have also been to embolden the hardliners inside Iran. We already see in the last parliamentary elections that it was the hardliners who actually campaigned against the nuclear deal uh, who won the upper hand. And there are June elections coming up in Iran in which uh, somebody will win who is uh, not as open as to talking to the United States as the Rouhani government has been. Uh, we also have a recent uh, piece of legislation passed by the parliament of Iran uh, that said that if there is not a lifting of the sanctions on the banking and the oil industries, uh, then the Iranian uh, Iranians must increase uh, their nuclear activities. Uh, this means that there's a very small window uh, between now uh, and the next presidential election in, six, uh, in June uh, uh, to make uh, some significant progress. Um, uh, Biden has said that he wants to rejoin the nuclear deal. Um, this, uh, he has said it throughout the campaign. And during the last hearings of his uh, soon to be Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, uh, he reiterated that uh, the Biden administration intends to go into the nuclear deal. 
Um, but they are already getting tremendous pushback. And you could see even at that hearing where he tried to say, well, you know, we want to strengthen the agreement. We want um, uh, to talk about the issues in the, in the region. Uh, and, he, and he talked about the Iran nuclear deal not as something that they would do immediately, but actually said it was a long way off. Um, we don't have the time for that. Uh, the um, uh, the, the uh, in, uh, people coming into the administration, several of them are very favorable to the Iran nuclear deal. In fact, uh, the head now of the CIA, William Burns, was somebody who worked on the back channels uh, to get the de deal going. Um, but uh, the, uh, uh, the Biden administration has recently um, uh, suggested that it wants to bring in uh, Rob Malley, who was in the National Security Council during the Obama administration and is now the president of the Ira International Crisis Group, to be the envoy for Iran. And that would mean uh, that he would come in and immediately begin this process. Um, which uh, some are calling compliance for compliance. Iran goes back into complying with the nuclear deal and the US goes in back into complying. But in the last couple of days since that suggestion of Rob Malley was made, there's been a tremendous outcry from the right. And we see this in the form of uh, Congress people like Tom Cotton, uh, we see it from right-wing Iranian uh, Americans, uh, and we see it from a number of right-wing columnists who have been putting out columns saying that, uh, that Rob Malley would be a terrible pick. And the reasons they say are uh, that he has, uh, that he is anti-Israel because he once talked to Hamas, uh, that he hasn't made a, um, overtures to the human rights uh, groups in Iran over the years, uh, that he would be too soft basically um, for these negotiations. Uh, they also said that um, they, they threw out that uh, when General Soleimani was killed that he had made a comment saying that wasn't good for diplomacy, uh, go figure. So mm. This is happening right now, uh, and I think we have to push back. Code Pink is uh, right now coming up with a petition to support uh, this uh, Rob Malley as the as the uh, Ir Iran envoy, and of course um, we have to support an immediate re-entering uh, into the into the nuclear deal. Uh, yesterday, there was a piece out by the foreign minister of Iran, Shabad Zarif, in Foreign Affairs. It was entitled, Iran wants the nuclear deal it made, don't ask Tehran to meet new demands. Um, and he also talked in there about how it was thanks to the U.S. invasions and arms sales that the Middle East is the most militarized region in the world. Uh, he said that uh, Saudi Arabia a country of less than 30 million people compared to Iran's 80 million people is the number one weapons purchaser in the world. And that the tiny country of the United Arab Emirates, which only has 1.5 million citizens, is the number eight importer of weapons in the entire world. And so the US under O'Biden has to not only go back into the Iran nuclear deal, has to take measures immediately to ease those sanctions um, and there is something that just came out in the um, uh, statement that the Biden administration made about its global work around COVID. Uh, and one of the paragraphs in there said that it would look at the effect of its sanctions in places like Iran and Venezuela to see what effect they have had on those countries being able to deal with the pandemic and take measures accordingly. So that's a positive thing. The U.S. has to stop blocking the 5 billion IMF loan that Iran has asked for in order to deal with the COVID crisis. Uh, and uh, deal, going back into the nuclear deal uh, with Iran is really the first step to addressing all of these other crises uh, in the region that have to be dealt with. So I hope we can all be working together to push the Biden administration uh, not to allow the hawks uh, to get the upper hand, for example, to uh, quash the appointment of uh, uh, this uh, Iran envoy, 
uh, and to move ahead quickly, there will be lots of measures to try to stop them in the Senate from these right-wingers. And we have to be ready for those. We have to fight against those and really push for um, the Biden administration do, to do what it promised to do, swiftly rejoin, rejoin the Iran nuclear deal. Thank you. Thank you, Medea. And we'll move